In this particular topic, addressing even the hand of Fatima, I've been tasked with addressing particularly the role of Muslim women in our society and of course the rectification of our current state in order that, may, that we may arrive at a more just society. I mention that because it's important that we start off with a firm intention for exactly why we're here and what is it that we need to listen to. Because subhanAllah, we're not addressing the role of women in our society as a means of putting our women or our young girls in check. We're not addressing the issue of the role of women in society in order to tell them that this is your place and that's where you should stay. The reason why we're addressing the role of the women in society so that we may act exactly according to the intention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to act when he made us the Khalifa of the earth. We address the topic with the intention to follow the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad in honoring women. We have the intention to rectify the, the errors and the wrongs in our community for the sake of healing so that we may actually build a prophetic community, that we may build a community that's based upon the principles that our beloved Messenger instructed us to do, and that is to elevate women. So I want to start off by addressing a particular thing, like just for us to get this out of the way. When we look at what Islam offers as a legacy, there are many things that we like to quote very quickly without actually deeply paying attention to the, to the deeper meanings of it. When we mention, of course, the likes of our beloved mother Khadija radiallahu ta'ala an as being the CEO of her own company, it's not only that she was this businesswoman, it's not only that she owned multiple properties that she used to house women who were victims of domestic violence and who feared their children being buried alive. It's not only, subhanAllah, that she was the chosen wife of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, for whom not only did he have deep love for, but the but even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, told Jibra'il, Ya Jibra'il, go tell Khadija, I send salam on her. Not only for those reasons, because she is one of the greatest examples of what a true woman, not just a Muslim woman, but what any woman should be. But because let us not forget that our beloved messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam said that Islam and this community was built on the wealth of Khadija. And so this is not only just her monetary wealth, this is the wealth of her mind. This is the wealth of her generous spirit. This is the wealth of her hard work. This is the wealth of her ingenuity. And this is the wealth of her generosity. That's why we remember our mother Khadija. When we look at Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, when we know that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam instructed us in a particular narration to take our, to take knowledge from her, subhanAllah, it would be Abu Musa al-Ansari who would say that even when the companions were confused or struggled on a legal matter, they would refer it to our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an. And if that wasn't enough, that she served as, a, as a, a legalist as well, basically as a mufti during the Khalifat of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, as well in the, in the, in, with Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an, if that wasn't enough, then in addition to she gave us all the components, subhanAllah, of prophetic medicine. If that wasn't enough, she was literally the teacher. She expounded what would be considered the basic legal theory of ahadith and all of legal the theology, subhanAllah. So when we look at our mother, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, she not only had that within herself, she, but she passed it on to more than 77 companions of the beloved messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, whom the majority of them were men. Why is that important? Because what we understand is that female Islamic scholarship is not something new. It's actually something that was developed in the home of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that she passed that on and she wasn't the only one that we find that in the likes of Um Sulaim, Um Darda, Fatiba bin Qais, Subhan, we find this tradition of preserving Islamic scholarship, we find this tradition of passing on knowledge and dawah, we find this tradition 
mission of preserving our deen from every aspect, we find it in the prophetic community. So when we began to tell these stories, subhanAllah, about how women were only on the sidelines or that they only participated from the back or from behind a curtain, we don't find that example in the home or in the community of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. When we look at the likes of Rufayda al aslamiyah who was basically the first to establish a health center outside of the, of the Masjid al Nabawi in Medina, that not only did she take care of those who were wounded during the time of war, but she actually nursed those who were sick, who were diseased, that she performed, subhanAllah, invasive procedures. That subhanAllah, this is the first development as we know to date, like the, the Greeks as we know in terms of medicine in houses, but she was the first as we know to date in order to establish a first health center. When we look at the likes of Asma bint Abu Bakr, who was subhanAllah, we, we know her to be the one of the woman of the two aprons who helped the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr when they were on their migration. But do we know that it was the companions of Abu Bakr and Umar bin Khattab and Uthman ibn Affan and other greats who actually used to seek her out for her dream interpretation before Ibn Sirim. Do we know that subhanAllah when we look at our history even of Umm Sulaim, we have women who were fighting on the battlefield. The mother of, Ma of uh, Anas bin Malik. We know that Nusayba Umm Amara, subhanAllah, when the Prophet وسلم, was in the battle of Uhud when those archers had descended from their places chasing after worldly things that the Prophet وسلم, said that when I look to my right and I look to my left all I could see was the sword of Um Amara subhanallah which means subhanallah in that moment where she was needed in that moment of, of desperation she came to the rescue of the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and her reward was nothing except for Jannah she was of those who would actually continue to spread Islam not only that, but there were other women, as I mentioned, Um Sulaim, subhanAllah, who was actually a soldier side by side with the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam. When we look beyond the, the community of Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, and to the tabi'een and the tabi tabi'een, we find women who continue to follow in this example. As a matter of fact, subhanAllah, we have Amra bint Abdul Rahman, who Imam Malik mentioned in his muwatta, was the primary authority of, had of a hadith. We find that subhanallah amongst Muslim women that this was actually one of the Islamic sciences by which when we say follow the Quran and the Sunnah the prophetic example you're not going to do that unless you pass through a woman because women are known as being muhadithin that a woman is never known to have fabricated a hadith when we talk about those who are the uplifters and the preservers of the knowledge of this deen by which all of us stand on then we have to admit that we stand on the shoulders of our great Muslim women when we look at the likes of Hafsa and Um Waraka, when we look at subhanAllah, even Nusayba, our mother Nusayba, who's buried in Egypt, that Imam Shafi'i not only learned from, but that she continued to fund his education. Why is that big masjid built after our mother Nusayba in Egypt, subhanAllah? And Imam Shafi'i even wrote in his, in his will that when I pass away, don't bring me to the grave unless you bring me to the home of Nusayba, our mother Nusayba, and and let her pray the funeral prayer over me before he reached the grave subhanallah we could look at the when we talk about the building of Islamic society and our first Islamic universities and institutions you're not going to get there unless you pass of course through Maryam and Fatima Fihri of, of the Qarawain University why do I say this so we can literally put aside do we have a legacy and a tradition of Muslim women who are not only great in terms of what they offer to the Muslim community, but in terms of with the health, the healing, the, the elevation, the foundation that they offer to humanity. Let's put that to the side. Because now the question is not about were they great. The question is whether or not we truly follow in their footsteps. See, the problem that we're having with the role of women in Islam is not whether or not we have a great tradition. It's not whether or not the Prophet وسلم, or Allah Azawajal actually elevated and grant women a great status. That's not the question. The question is whether or not we elevate women, whether we honor women, whether or not our daughters are elevated and have a place in our community. And so with that, I want to say, what's next? 
How do we build? How are we going to grow, of course, and use the, them as a particular example? The first thing is, in these five minutes, may Allah intervene and help us. That in, these, in this first thing, we have to understand, when did we lose it? When did we lose it? And I don't have uh, enough time, subhanAllah, to delve into the when the Muslims begin to meet all kinds of colonialist thoughts. And we begin to adopt certain men, a certain mentality that is actually not something that is consistent with our deen. It's important that when we even look at Western academia, that we think inside of structures. We think inside of theses and antitheses. We think inside of uh, structuralism and deconstructionism. But actually, subhanAllah, Islam is more vibrant, more dynamic, more flexible than that. And so, subhanAllah, when we, we recognize that when we traded our tradition for someone else's understanding, someone else's ideology, even inside of our universities today, when we're trading our tradition for someone else's philosophy, we are literally putting our tradition, but throwing it behind our back and literally setting our Muslim society astray, putting us off track, literally throwing us back into the dark ages. That when the Prophet Muhammad came, he didn't come to, to keep the status quo. He didn't come to say that the Byzantine Empire of his time, which were a power to be reckoned with at that time, he didn't say, well, they're, they're, they are above us in science, or they are above us, or they are ahead of us in this particular way, so let us follow them. In fact, he said, my job is to actually shake up their thinking. My job is to actually undo some of the mentality that they have that has landed us in the condition and the position that we're we're in. And so I want to tell us that we have literally, as a Muslim community, followed, right, us followed other people into that lizard hole and landed us dead smack in the midst of gender politics that are not consistent with the greatness and the elevation that is consistent with the honoring of women. And so we have to be willing to look at this. Are we willing? To follow the sunnah, are we willing to be the khalifa that Allah Azza wa Jal intended us to be? Are we willing to take up this tradition and actually not be the tail that we're connecting to, the tail of the horse that's moving forward in our gender politics? Because in reality, we have a lot to say about the position of women, particularly as it relates today in this debate about what is a woman. Is a woman only in her physicality? Is a woman only in her body? Well, subhanAllah, even their books on brain wars that talk about that, that even the detail of femininity and womanhood is subhanAllah inside of her brain chemistry. It's in every aspect of her DNA. But beyond just the physicality, what Islam says is that my soul is a woman and that cannot be easily transformed that being that being a woman is not something that's meant to be played just by politics it's not something that you could literally cut me up into different pieces and then become what I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me and you as women exactly who you are and that's not something that can be manipulated may Allah help and intervene I want to look at when we talk about what role does she play in this last one minute and 20 seconds. It's such a huge topic. The first thing is, is that we have to recognize that when we talk about women, stop talking about them as if somehow they are outside the human species. Her first job as a woman is to be a full and complete human being. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the woman, created Adam. SubhanAllah, when he created Adam, and SubhanAllah, I, I, I want to get into this, but we got 49 seconds. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and then split them, so they became countless men and women, he created them with the intention that they would be the Khalifa of the earth. And she was also a part of that intention. Let us not trade our Islamic understanding of that for a different ideology. I want us to look at this in these last 30 seconds. That when we talk about the role of women, look at our mother Hajar. 
What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did with our mother Hajar as he literally brought her and left her in the middle of the desert. He literally caused Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam to go away from her. And he built the holiest city that we know to date with the greatest blessing around this woman. He built, subhanAllah, the city of Mecca around her tawakkul, around her yaqeen, around her steadfastness. And even we visit that same place from her effort, drink from the fruit of her labor of Zamzam in order for our own healing. Let's look at our daughters, of course, and say that they're Fatima Zahra. When we look at the role of women, subhanAllah, we say they're the likes of Um Amara. They're, they're meant to defend this deen. They're meant to defend the messenger of Allah. Their places in activism. Their places in journalism. Their places in medicine. Their places wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the skills and the talents and the mindset and the drive to achieve. That is the role of the Muslim woman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to fulfill it so that we can live up to exactly who we're meant to be. Jazakum al khair and assalamu alaikum.